This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. We're thankful that you're here to study, continue our study of Lesson 7, What Does It Mean to Be Just a Christian? We are studying, beginning in the last class, that it means confidence, boldness, a certain assurance, trust in God, all of those kinds of things involved in this idea of confidence and boldness. We want to ask you to make a record of your memory verse for this class, 2 Timothy 1, verse 12. 2 Timothy 1, verse 12. We've seen thus far that the Christian's confidence is based upon God, our being in Christ, and our faith, and that the Christian should be confident in speaking the Word of God, that faithful Christians have confidence in prayer, and that the faithful Christian is confident about the judgment day. Now we want to begin with the last point on this subject, the Christian must not ca cast this confidence away. We must not cast this confidence away. In other words, we must not lose this confidence, this boldness. Let's look in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 34 and 35. Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 34 and 35. For you had compassion on me in my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. The Hebrew writer was writing to those who were Christians and had a Jewish background. And some of those were beginning to question whether they had done the right thing in their obedience of the gospel. They were beginning to think maybe we ought to go back to being members of the Jewish faith rather than being Christians. And throughout this epistle, the Hebrew writer exhorted them, don't go back. And that's what he's saying here. Don't cast your confidence away. You remain steadfast in your confidence and in your boldness, in your assurance of the things taught in the gospel. He said that they had, be, had been willing to even give up some of their worldly goods, their material possessions, to help the Hebrew writer who was in prison. And that in doing that, clearly, they had shown great faith, great confidence, that God would continue to provide for them even though they gave up some of the things that he had already provided for them. And the Hebrew writer is saying, don't cast away that confidence, that assurance, because if you do, you'll lose that great reward. We need to be careful then that we don't lose our confidence, our boldness, because such confidence based on God, being in Christ in our faith, has great reward. God will reward our confidence if we retain it unto the end. Then the memory verse that we just assigned, 2 Timothy 1, verse 12. 2 Timothy 1, verse 12. Let's see what the Apostle Paul, by inspiration, had to say in this verse. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. In this context, Paul had talk, talked about how he had suffered for preaching the gospel of Christ. And in this verse, he says, Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. Why, Paul? 
you were suffering for preaching the gospel, for living a righteous life, why should you not be ashamed? He said, because I know whom I have believed. He had that confidence in God. He had that assurance, that trust in God, that certainty that God was able to keep that which Paul had committed to him unto that day, clearly referring to the judgment day. Paul knew that he had committed his life to God, and God would keep that life until that day when we will all be judged by the Son of God. Paul knew who he believed and was persuaded. He had confidence, boldness, assurance that God was able to keep what Paul had committed to him. And you and I need to have that same persuasion, confidence, boldness, that God will keep whatever we've committed to him unto the judgment day that is coming. Then the final passage on this subject from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 57 and 58. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 57 and 58. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In the context of Paul had talked about the victory that we have over sin, over the grave, over death. And we have that victory through our Lord Jesus Christ who overcame sin, overcame death, overcame the grave. And he says on the basis of that fact, since we have that certain knowledge that we have the victory through Jesus, we ought to be steadfast, immovable. Don't throw our confidence away. Don't cast our assurance, our boldness away, but remain steadfast in the faith. And he says, always abounding in the work of the Lord, doing that work which God tells us about in his wonderful work, word. He says, if we do that, we can know that our labor is not in vain if it's in the Lord. It will be rewarded. God will take care of us. We have that certainty. We trust Him. We know, we're persuaded that He is going to do what He's promised. So we ought not to cast our confidence away, but be steadfast, stay in our place in the gospel, be immovable, always abounding in God's work, knowing that our labor is not in vain. It is not useless. It is not empty if our labor is in the Lord. So the Christian must not cast this wonderful confidence, this boldness away. Let's retain that confidence and be assured as we strive to do the will of God and teach His wonderful word. Ninthly, being just a Christian means persecution. It means persecution. Now, up until this point in our lesson, we have been focusing on the positive things associated with Christianity. We did that on purpose. We wanted to have firmly fixed in our minds many of the wonderful blessings that God gives us if we're just a Christian. But we must be balanced in our study and our teaching of the Word of God. It's not enough to focus just on the positive. God commands us to teach the whole counsel of God, all of His Word. And there are negative things associated with His Word. There are difficulties that you and I are going to have to suffer as Christians, if we're going to remain faithful to Him. 
So we want to study that in the remainder of this lesson. Some of those things that are more negative in nature, but let's never lose sight of the blessings that God has given to us for being just Christians. One of those negative things, we will suffer persecution. Now, if we arm ourselves with that knowledge, that fact, hopefully we'll be better prepared to deal with it. And we hope that there are some passages of Scripture that we'll study that will help out each of us to do that. Let's begin with this promise in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. There we have it. There is a promise from God. If we're going to live godly lives, lives that are dedicated to God, that are centered upon God and His will, then God promises we will suffer persecution. As we study through the Bible, has that been the case? Have we seen that those who live godly in Christ Jesus suffer persecution? It certainly is the case. The Apostle Paul, who penned these letters by the this letter by the inspiration of God, certainly suffered persecution for living godly. And you and I will too. If we're not suffering persecution, then perhaps we're not living the godly life that God pr promises or uh, commands us to do. So here's the promise. If we will live godly in Christ Jesus, we're going to suffer persecution. That's also seen in the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. Philippians 1, verse 29. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. The word translated granted, it says it has been granted to you. The word translated granted is a form of the word that is translated grace. And the idea is this is a gift. So whatever God is talking about here, he considers as a gift. And if we're going to please him, we need to educate our minds to think this is a gift. What is it? Well, he talks about you ought not only to believe on Jesus. Yes, that's required. That's something that God wants us to do. But the gift is that we're going to suffer it for his sake, for his name, for doing his will, for walking in his steps, following his example. You and I have this gift that we're going to suffer persecution. We're going to learn, hopefully, as we go through these passages, how we can consider it a gift and how we can live godly while suffering persecutions. But let's look now at John chapter 15 to listen to the words of our Savior on this subject. John, the 15th chapter, verses 18 through 20. John 15, verses 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So here Jesus talks to his followers at that time, and through their word recorded in the Bible, he's talking to you and me today. Jesus begins by saying, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me first. And we know that 
from the record of the gospel accounts. Certainly many in the world hated Jesus enough to crucify him on that cursed cross of Calvary. So we as Christians need to realize that if we're followers of Christ, many in the world are going to hate us just like they hated him. We need to make sure they don't hate us because of our unrighteousness, our wickedness, but that they hate us because we're living like Jesus, following in his steps. In verse 19, the Lord said, If you were of the world, the world would love you, would love its own. But you are not of the world, for I have called you out of the world. How does Jesus call us out of the world? Through the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 14. So we need to know that we've separated ourselves from the ungodly practices of the world in our obedience to the gospel. And therefore, the world is not going to love us. We need to recognize that fact. We are not going to be the most popular people in the world if we live the life of Jesus. People are going to heap abuse on us. They're going to cause us to be persecuted because we're not like them and we won't stoop to their level to join into those ungodly things that the world practices. And Jesus said, the servant is not greater than the master. Of course, he is the master. And if we're faithful Christians, we're his servants. And he promised, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. And so we need to be prepared for that fact. As we go out into the world and living our daily life, we need to recognize people are going to persecute us for being followers of Jesus. But how do we handle such persecution? How do we deal with that persecution? One way that we've uh, mentioned already is that we prepare ourselves for it. We recognize in our mind it's going to happen. And one of the principles involved in any uh, exercise of this kind is knowing what's coming. If you know that you're going to perse be persecuted, you need to prepare for it and be ready for it so that you can deal with it properly. But probably the best advice that we can have on this subject is from the example of Jesus. If we follow his example and how he dealt with persecution, then we'll be able to deal with it too. And to see his example, we'd like to bring to the screen a very important uh, scripture on this subject. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23. 1 Peter 2, verse 23, talking about Jesus, Peter said by the inspiration of God, who when he was reviled, that word means that strong, hateful, accusing words were hurled his way. People spoke badly of him. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. Jesus did not strike back at those who said those hateful words to him, who accused him of things which he didn't do. Then he goes on to say, When he suffered, he did not threaten. And oh, how Jesus suffered, not for his sins, but for mine and for yours. He suffered unrighteously, and yet he did not threaten. How did Jesus keep from reviling back? How did he keep from threatening those who caused him to suffer? The answer is in the last part of the verse. He committed himself to him who judges righteously. That's how Jesus did it. He committed himself to God who judges righteously. In other words, Jesus prepared his mind by saying to himself and to the Father, I am giving my life to you.
I am placing my life in your hands, and I know that you judge righteously. These people who are persecuting me, who are reviling me, who are causing me to suffer, they are wrong. They are judging improperly. They are doing this unjust, unjustly. Jesus said that, I'm sure, in his mind. And he committed himself to the Father, knowing that the Father would judge righteously. How do we apply that? We know that if we live godly lives, some are going to persecute us. We determine in our minds we are not going to strike back against them. We are not going to do the kinds of things that they do wrong against us. We're not going to go down to their level. Instead, what we're going to say is, God, I commit my life to you. And I know that you know my heart, you know my words, my thoughts, my actions, and you will judge righteously. And I'm leaving my life in your care. That's how, excuse me, that's how we can learn to suffer persecution with the right attitude. So when we are faced with that kind of persecution, bring to our minds the example of Jesus and how he dealt with and overcame such suffering by committing himself to the Father who judges righteously. Then in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, I believe we get another insight into how we can deal with suffering properly. 1 Peter 4, verses 14 through 16. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as an e a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in a other people's matters. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Peter tells us, if we're reproached for the name of Christ, we're blessed. We receive a blessing. Why? Again, because we're identified with Jesus. Notice he says, if you're reproached for the name of Christ, that is, you're living like Jesus. You're speaking like Him. You're following in His path. If you're reproached for that reason, you're blessed. You're united with Christ. He was blessed. He was persecuted reproached for that reason. And we want to be one with Jesus. We want to identify with Him and be one with Him. And so that's how we can be blessed in terms of these persecutions. He says, The Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you if you're persecuted, if you're reproached for the name of Christ. We will be glorified by God if we receive suffering and persecution for being righteous, for being godly, for being like the Son of God. And he says that on their part, that is the part of those evildoers, God is blasphemed, is speaking, uh, spoken evil against, but on your part he is glorified. We can glorify God if we suffer persecution and we accept it with the right attitude and continue to act like Jesus. That's how we can endure such suffering, by keeping that in mind. But in verse 15, Peter tells us, don't you be suffering as a murderer, as one who uh, is uh, involved in evil kinds of activities, who's a busybody in other uh, people's activities, He's a thief, an evildoer. Don't you be persecuted for that. That's what, not what God is talking about. Because when we're persecuted for those reasons, we deserve what we get. Whereas 
when we're persecuted for being a faithful Christian, we don't deserve that. But if we accept it with the right attitude, we will be glorified and we glorify God. And in verse 16, God tells us, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed. Don't take shame from that kind of treatment, but rather be glorified, be glad, be happy, because you're glorifying God in this manner. Again, this is an education process. The willingness to suffer persecution doesn't come naturally. Our mind must be educated by the Word of God in order for us to be able to deal with this scripturally, spiritually, the way that God would have us to deal with it. And hopefully, as we look at these passages, it will help us to look at suffering with the right view, with the view of God as expressed in His wonderful Word. Then in the book of Romans, Romans the eighth chapter, one of the most beautiful chapters in God's wonderful Word. Romans chapter 8, verse 17 and verse 18. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We know that if we're Christians, we're children of God. He had said that in verse 16 of Romans 8. And if we're children, then we're heirs. We stand to inherit eternal life from God. But we're not just heirs, we're heirs of God, and we're joint heirs with Christ. Notice, though, at the end of verse 17, he says, we're joint heirs with Christ. If we suffer with Him, then we shall also be glorified with Him. Now, we want to receive that glory, don't we? We want to receive it in a humble way, not in an arrogant or self-righteous way. We want to receive it because we want to receive it with God and Jesus. But notice what he says. If you suffer with Him, then you shall be glorified with Him. If we're not willing to suffer with Jesus, we're not going to receive that glory that He promised. It's just that simple. So what, how does this help us? We keep in our mind, if we are willing to suffer with Christ, that is by living His life, the way He lived His life, then we know that in the end, we'll be glorified together with Him. And Paul goes on to say that these sufferings that we experience in this life are of such a small magnitude when compared to the glory which shall be revealed. Yes, they're difficult. Yes, they're hard to endure, these sufferings, but they're not worthy to compare, be compared with the great glory which we'll share with Jesus when He comes again if we're willing to suffer with Him for living a righteous, godly Christian life. Much the same kind of thinking is found in the beautiful passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17 and 18. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Here we learn of our light affliction. Of course, affliction is suffering. Those hardships and difficulties that we experience as Christians. Notice, God describes them as light, not heavy, 
He says, the light affliction, which is but for a moment. God is showing us that this suffering that we endure is temporary. It's not permanent if we're faithful Christians. It's temporary. And then he goes to make the contrast. The, the affliction is light. It's temporary. But what? He says, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So notice the contrast. The suffering is light and it's temporary, but the glory is exceeding. It's great. It exceeds our wildest imaginations. And it is eternal. That glory will last forever, long after our suffering has been left behind in this life of suffering. And he says, we don't look at the things which are seen. Those things are temporary. The Christian has his or her mind and eye set on the things that are not seen, the eternal things reserved in heaven for us like eternal life in the joys of heaven. So we need to keep things in perspective, keep the proper focus on our life. Yes, these difficulties are hard to endure sometimes, but they're light in comparison to the glory and they're temporary in comparison to that eternal joy that we'll have in heaven if we're willing to endure this suffering with the proper godly attitude. Then we'd like to bring to the screen from the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 12. 2 Timothy 2, verse 12. Here's a promise from God. If we endure, we shall also reign with Him. Literally, if we endure suffering, if we endure hardship, difficulties, persecution, if we do that, then what, God? Here's the promise. We shall also reign with Him. But if we deny Him, He also will deny us. So what a wonderful promise, but that conditional word if is found at the beginning of verse 12. The promise is we will reign with Jesus. We will rule with Him as kings and priests in His heavenly kingdom if we're found faithful, if we endure suffering with Him. But if we say, no, I don't want to endure that suffering, and to avoid that suffering, I'll deny Christ, not just by my words, but by my actions. For example, I might refuse to stand up for Jesus on the job or in my family or in the face of enemies. I might refuse to acknowledge that I'm a Christian. I might refuse to speak out against that which is wrong because I'm afraid. I'm denying Christ when I do that. And God said, if I deny Him, He's going to deny me. If I endure with Him, then I will reign with Him. My choice, your choice, this ought to help us to keep in our mind there is a purpose in suffering and there is an end of suffering and the end is far more valuable than any of the difficulties that we have to endure in this life. Also in 2 Timothy, this, chap this time the third chapter in verse 11. 2 Timothy 3 verse 11. Persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Isn't that beautiful? Paul talks about his past life and the persecutions and afflictions which he endured at various cities on those evangelistic journeys that we read about in the book of Acts. And he said, I endured those. I persevered. I held up under those sufferings in his mind 
because he loved Jesus. Jesus was all the world to him. He was willing to suffer for Christ because Christ suffered for him. But notice the promise at the end of verse 11. Out of them all, the Lord delivered me. And we have that promise too. We can know with a certainty that eventually God will deliver us from all of those sufferings and those persecutions and those afflictions. It may not be on the time schedule that we think is best, but that's because we're not wise enough to understand the big picture. God will deliver us, and we need to keep that in our mind. That will help us to endure that persecution and that suffering that God promises will come to those who are faithful to Him and His beloved Son. We hope that these verses from God's wonderful Word will help each of us to do a better job of enduring suffering and persecution for the cause of Christ, that we will be able to face these persecutions with a godly, Christ-like manner and spirit, and that we'll be able to overcome them through our faith, our love for the Lord, which will motivate us to endure with Him and for Him those persecutions, knowing that glory is in store in the end, and the Lord will deliver us from those persecutions. Keep these things in mind, if you will. Study your memory verses. Study your notes. Continue to study your Bible as I strive to do the same much, much more.